Hi, I'm Eileen Roach. I'm the founder of Designs and Machine Embroidery, and I'm thrilled that you're joining me today. Today, we're going to answer the top 10 questions that I am asked, and also my good friend Margaret Moorhead from the Virtual Sewing Guild. And I see some of you are already signing in, like Renee Dollar from Oklahoma City. And she's new to embroidery and she tunes in every Thursday. Thank you. I, I hope that you do find answers here every week, Renee. It's really our mission at Dime to offer solutions to all embroiderers, whether they're newbies, you know, uh, intermediate embroiderers, or even people who have been stitching for a long time. I feel that we can always learn from one another. Um, and thank you for your nice comment about my grandchild. She is here and of course she's not in this building, but um, I'm going to share a photo in a little bit, in a little bit. And Marjorie, nice to have you here. You're getting ready to embroider on the back of some jackets and, oh, you purchased the totally tubular hooping station. Awesome. I love that. Yeah. I think you will find it very helpful. And Marion, um, you've been stitching for over 15 years and you're always looking for something new. Aren't we all? I mean, I've been stitching for over 20 years, probably closer to 30. And you know, I'm still learning for sure. So before we go on anymore, we hope that you'll sign in. Let us know where you're watching from. And uh, if you have questions, please type them into the chat because uh, we will be addressing specific questions as they come up. But first, let's let me welcome Margaret Moorhead from the Virtual Sewing Guild. Hello, Margaret. Excited to be here. Oh. Embroidery is my favorite subject. Well, and you're really good at it, Margaret. You've been at it a long time. How long now? I got my first embroidery machine in 1997 and it had the four by four hoop because that's as big yeah. as it came at the time. So a few know, years. Learning in those small hoops really made us good embroiderers, I think, right? It did. We learned how to combine designs. And the benefit of that is a smaller hoop. You don't need to know as much about stabilizing because the design is smaller. So it's a little bit easier. That's right. But you also kind of have to master continue, you know, connecting embroidery designs or maybe even splitting designs, all kinds of things. Oh boy, I know when we first got started, there wasn't a lot of information out there or education and uh, we were just winging it. But some of us really excelled like yourself. Well, thank you. And we didn't have as many choices of stabilizers and the different weights of threads that we have. We didn't have the things that can make us really get the professional results that we can get now. So it's really exciting, the progression that the sewing industry has made. I agree. There's been so many improvements. There sure has. So, you know, we do have some questions coming in. Um, like Kathy Stossner, Stossner asked, what's the best thread for letters? Well, here at Dime, we like to use 60 weight polyester exquisite thread. It's a finer thread than the standard 40, and it works really great for small letters because you want those nice crisp edges of your lettering, right? You don't want it to look like a sawtooth. And so if your thread is too heavy, it can overlap itself at the edges. And, you know, instead of giving you a nice even column, it kind of, you know, pushes out to the side. So that's what we like for medium to small lettering. If it's jumbo lettering, then the regular 40 weight, right, Margaret? Exactly. And once I tried that thinner weight, because I, like everyone else, I had trouble getting those little tiny letters, like on a logo or something to work. And once that lightweight thread came out, it was a game changer. So yeah, you need to use a thread that's appropriate to the design that you're doing. Absolutely. So here's a good question that one that um, I, well, hi from Minnesota too, Judy, nice to have you here. But let's see, Sharon is getting her first magnetic hoop and what size should she, should she purchase? You know, so many people ask that. So there's a, 
I, it's a two point answer. If you're quilting, if that's the main intention for purchasing a magnetic hoop, then I suggest you get the largest hoop that your machine will accommodate. So if a six by 10 is the largest hoop your machine can use, then purchase that. If you are going to use a magnetic hoop for most of your embroidery, like I do, then I tell, tell you to take a moment and think about what size hoop do you normally gravitate to? Is it a five by seven? Is it the eight by eight? You know, what's your go-to size hoop? And that's the one that you should make your first magna, uh, monster hoop purchase in. So I hope that answered that question. Well, shall we share baby photos? I'm not going to bore you with a gazillion. Maybe we'll save that for another day. But we do have um, a picture of, here is Emma Grace. Oh, I'm sorry. Emma Grace Milstead. And she was born last Friday on April 8th. And she weighs eight pounds, five ounces. And she is precious. We're so Oh, my blessed. gosh. She's beautiful oh i didn't have anything to do with it but oh my we are just over the moon we're just over the moon she's really sweet so here's a picture right after birth her mom janelle my daughter and her handsome husband keegan milstead they make a powerful team Keegan is already a doctor and Janelle will be a doctor when she graduates in may from med school so they are a really uh knowledgeable team. Of course, it's different reading about being a, a parent, right? When you learn all about having a baby and so forth as to really being a parent, but they're a strong team and they're doing really well. I'm very proud of them. Isn't that fun? Well, congratulations. Beautiful daughter and her, your son-in-law, very, yeah. very beautiful family. Yeah. It's really sweet. He's in the Navy. So it's a military code here. They're just doing great. So proud of them. Okay, so let's get to our questions. So let's see. You know, it was fun kind of brainstorming with you about the questions that you get and the questions I get. And, you know, as we talked, I realized almost all of the answers are in Deborah Jones's embroidery compass. And that is the product of the day, of the week that this program today is brought to you by the Embroiderer's Compass. And it's on sale for $19.99. We're going to handle more questions than stabilizer, but believe me, if you have this in your sewing studio, it is a go-to resource when you're wondering what size needle, what size, uh, what type of stabilizer for that thread you are, I mean, that fabric you are about to hoop. So the first question, this is your top number one, right, Margaret? How do I get my embroidery to stitch out flat without pocket? That is the question that I have gotten since I started traveling and teaching embroidery um, nationwide, which was in 2002. And that is the question that I think everybody wants. They spend so much time trying to get it perfect. They've got the good embroidery machine. They've got the designs. They've got the fabric. But now what do we do? How do we get perfect results? Well, I love the comment that came in first. It said she had the tubular hooping station because that brings me to my first suggestion, have the proper tools. So make sure you've got a new needle in your machine. Make sure you're using quality thread and then you're going to, and make sure you use a hoop that's appropriate for the size. So if you're doing a little two inch design, don't, try to use this huge hoop because you've got too much play in the fabric. Then the other thing that I love to do is to prepare my fabric. Now, many of you, probably all of you have heard about stabilizing your fabric, but there is another step and that is what I refer to as preparing your fabric. And that's when you take your piece of fabric that you're going to be embroidering on and you fuse something to the back of it. It could be like a fusible interfacing, but now, and that's how we started, was using products that were already on the market. But now that the sewing field has advanced, we have products that are specifically designed for this. And in the dime line, um, I believe it's called um, Fuse So Soft. Did I get that right? Yes, it is. Fuse So Soft. 
Okay. And what the important part of that is the fuse word, because if you were just to take an extra layer of stabilizer and put it on there, you have not changed the properties of your fabric. So when you fuse something on, your fabric can now hold more stitches. So think about this. This is a long answer. I apologize. When you do when you're doing your embroidery, you have this piece of fabric and you have this needle that has a thread in it and it goes down and it comes out. Now your piece of fabric has one extra little thread in it, two if you're not balanced correctly, but you've got a piece of thread in it. Then you've got another piece with the next stitch and another piece with the next stitch. So this piece of fabric that was designed to hold no additional stitches could have 20,000 extra pieces of thread in there. And it's just not designed to hold that. So by fusing that um, preparation product on the back of it, you've now told that little piece of fabric that was designed to just be a piece of fabric that now it's not only going to be a beautiful piece of fabric, it's going to hold all your stitches. Now, that being said, that's preparing the fabric you would then, or I then, stabilize as normal. So if it's a dense fabric, a dense design, I use like um, a medium to heavyweight tearaway or a medium to heavyweight cutaway. So my prep has really nothing to do with my stabilization. Don't give up any of your stabilization products just because you prepped your product. I hope that makes sense. I, was, I, yeah. I couldn't get my words out. That's an excellent answer. And I call that, you know, you say prep the fabric. I, I stabilize the fabric with Fuse So Soft. And then I stabilize the embroidery with stabilizer. Because you're right. The fabric is not intended to have all those stitches pounded into it. So good answer. I love it. Thank I'm going to jump back, Cindy, uh, uh, Margaret, and answer Cindy's question. Because she said she's so jealous of those who can get a magnetic hoop. How are we progressing on the magnetic hoops for the uh, Burnett? Well, we are progressing. I can just tell you, everything takes forever, but we are making progress and uh, it's kind of out of our hands right now. We're working with Bernina, so we're waiting on parts from them and so forth, And but we're working on it and it's going to happen, which is the best answer, right? That it's going to happen. So nice. let's see. Okay, so the next um, question is, what's the best needle to use for embroidery? Now, Eileen, you know that as well as I do, there are a lot of different answers to everything that we do. So again, I'm going to go back to use a good quality needle. Use a new needle that you know is going to work. So I find some people will stitch it, stitch every day, eight hours a day, and they don't change that needle until it breaks or until they're just so frustrated they have no other choice. But when you're using a good quality needle, make, make sure that it's for the correct project. So like my favorite, and I've been, I've taught classes and I have had, you know, a hundred people in a class. So I know what works for the products that I use. And 90% of the time, I'm going to start with the size 80 sharp needle and Microtex is the one that I usually go to in the line of needles that I use. But the main thing is it's sharp and it has a slightly bigger eye on it, which allows, and a, a scarf that a lot, a scarf is a, a groove in the front of the needle that allows the thread to sit in it. So as it's going through that little piece of fabric we talked about, the thread is shielded by the scarf and with a little bit bigger eye, an elongated eye, the thread, because of those two things, the thread will not shred. And then the point of the needle is important because you've got that poor little piece of fabric that's been stabilized or prepped, and then you've got that stabilizer under it. So every time it goes and takes a stitch, it goes through three, uh, at least three layers of things, fabric, prep, and stabilization. So you need to make sure it's a new needle. And a lot of people, so the needle I use, like I said, is a Microtex, but if you're doing wovens, you want a sharp needle. And Eileen, we talked about this. If you're doing the niche, you want the ballpoint or the rounded tip needle. And then the other thing is make sure it's new. And many people 
get so frustrated and they want to, they try a million different things instead of just trying to change that little needle. So you could be getting skipped stitches. Why? Because your needle's not sharp enough. Your needle could be slightly bent and you don't even know it. It doesn't look like it, but it's not picking up the embroidery thread like it should. So when in doubt, use a new needle, the best one that you can, sharp for your um, like I have a silk behind me, sharp for your silks and cottons and non-stretchy fabrics and rounded for the stretchy fabrics. And the size, I like an 80, but in classes a lot of times, if we were having issues with um, maybe the needle threader didn't work, or maybe we were getting a lot of shredded thread, we don't have we did not have every single type of needle in bulk with us. So we had 80s and we had 90s. So sometimes we just simply go up to a size 90 needle and it would give us better results. So those are my tricks on needles. That's awesome, for sure. And, you know, Dime makes Triumph needles. That's our brand of needles. They come in both ballpoint and sharp in a variety of sizes. So we always say, you know, select it for the fabric first and then the size for uh, also the fabric. But on micro lettering, on, like we talked earlier about 60 weight thread, we use a, uh, a fine needle, you know, like a 65 or a 70 or a 75 at the most. Now, someone was asking, Pamela wanted to know, if you're using 60 weight thread for the small lettering, do you use 60 weight for the bobbin? Well, we always use embroidery bobbin thread in the bobbin, which is a much lighter weight than even the 60 weight. That's what we use. So we don't change that out. And let's see, Carolyn wants to know where are the hoops, magnetic hoops made? Well, 80% um, of the hoops are made here in the US. They are assembled here and some one, you know, a small percentage comes from overseas. So, you know, it's a global world today, right? It's a, a very rare product that you are wearing, eating, using that is all made in, in America. Let's see, Cheryl DeLuca wants to know, does, uh, do we have plans for the Janome 15,000? Uh, to have a monster hoop for that. Because of that rear attachment on that hoop, you know, Cheryl, take a look at your hoop and notice how far away that attachment is from the actual sewing field. That limits the weight that you can put on that machine and our metal hoops, the magnetic hoops, would, are too heavy to create a hoop that size for the 15,000. So there are no plans for that. And I, I wish there were. Um, I love a, a Janome machine for sure. Um, so anyway, okay, so what's our next question? Let's see, we'll bring that up. And is how do I embroider on towels? Well, this is one of the top reasons why people embroider, right? It's, it's often they buy an embroidery machine because they want to embroider on towels. So what's your advice, Margaret? Well. And, and I'm going to jump into that, but I want to back up to the um, bobbin thread question because that's a great question. And I want you to think of our poor little piece of fabric again. And you've got this nice lightweight um, thread on the top. And then if you put a heavyweight bobbin thread on, your embroidery is so stiff. It doesn't want to bend. It just is like wearing a, a cardboard box on your embroidery design. So Eileen, I love that you reminded them that, yeah, we do want to use a bobbin weight thread. Otherwise our embroidery doesn't have a chance. You're just adding so much bulk to that design. Um, it can, yeah, it can be up to 30% more fabric when you use the wrong, 30% more bulk when you use the wrong bobbin thread. So very important. Okay, but back to towels. Towels are great to embroider on because it's ready made. They're not, you can get some inexpensive ones to practice on, but there's a lot of controversy out there. Oh, never, never, never use a sticky stabilizer. Well, you know, I'm one for testing because there's a lot of different sticky stabilizers out there. But the biggest problem people have is trying to hoop the towel. And that's where your magnetic hoop comes in because it's absolutely fabulous. I've seen people try to hoop a towel in a traditional hoop and they've broken the hoop. It's <laughs> most towels are too thick to hoop. So we have to have a different system to do that. That magnetic hoop, I think are great. If you don't have a magnetic hoop, what I recommend is that you hoop your stabilizer and then use that wonderful basting feature that comes on most of our machines now and baste the stabilizer, baste the project, the towel 
to the stabilizer. The other important thing is towels are lofty. They've got all that terry cloth, that beautiful plushness that we love. So you want to use a topper on that. And this is where some people get confused between, and again, my terminology, a topper versus a stabilizer. So again, if you're putting a topper on, you're not really changing the way you're going to stabilize. So if if you're doing a design that's totally filled in, you would probably use a tearaway stabilizer. That's the stabilizer you would use, but that doesn't mean you don't put that tearaway on the bottom because you're putting the topper on the top. The topper on the top is to hold that terry cloth down or whatever the fibers are, to hold that down while it's embroidering so you can get those beautiful flat stitches that you wanna get on your projects. So don't hoop traditional hooping ways, use your magnetic hoop or um, baste it in place and put a topper on and stabilize uh, according to the design. Awesome. Great advice. That's absolutely the right way to do it for sure. Let's see. Uh, yeah. Like Julianne, she floats her towels. So you can hoop a towel. I mean, now I will tell you if you're using them, no matter what hoop you're using, and if you're just floating a towel, you will have to handle the weight of that towel. You, you know, don't forget like, you know, the sewing field is what's going to be captured on top of the hoop, but all that excess weight of the rest of the towel can pull the sewing field out of the hoop, whether it's hooped, floating, basted, pinned, you name it. It still has the ability because it's so heavy to pull it out of the uh, sewing field. So be careful, maintain that weight, keep it up you know, on the machine table, it's best if you can have it above the machine bed, but you know, that's not always possible. That I, on giant beach towels, I use my weightless quilter to be honest with you. But, that's a good idea. Yeah. Good idea. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's see. Would a wash away stabilizer work on the back of a towel? Sure, absolutely. And that would be great because you don't really want a big piece of visible stabilizer on the wrong side of the towel. So you most certainly could use a wash away. Let's see. So um, I just, you know, someone's asking about um, bobbin weight thread is usually 60 weight. Let's see. Or has it changed? Julianne said uh, is usually 60 weight. Has it changed? Well, you know, if it's, if I have a question, I answer, I asked Deborah Jones. And so she tells me, well, it does vary. It can be 60 or 90. Usually 60 and 70 are the ones that are readily available to us. So um, don't go anything with a smaller number than 60 because that would be a heavier weight, right? Mm -hmm. The larger the number, the lighter the thread. That's whoever came up with that, right, Margaret? <laughs> They just want to confuse us. Yeah, right. And now Mary Hag says, um, what do you do if machine skip stitches while doing edge to edge? Well, my number one um, advice is if you're having skip stitches, that's a needle problem. That's a dull needle. Or just, you know, think of you, you if you try to use a sharp needle on a knit fabric, you will definitely have mm -hmm. skipped stitches. And so if you don't know what skipped stitches are, just sew a running, you know, straight line on a t-shirt knit with a sharp needle. And you'll see exactly what I mean. Instead of having consistent, you know, 2.0 length straight stitches, you'll have 4.0, 1.5, 3.0, right? That's a mess. So yeah. on my edge to edge quilting, if I have skip stitches, I need a new needle. And okay, so now you have a design with skip stitches, you have two choices. You can rip it out and start over. And I know oh, people hate to rip out, but really it doesn't take that long with edge to edge quilting, right? If you catch it on the first design. Um, but you can also, if you are in the hoop, if it's still all in the hoop, then don't take it out of the hoop. Don't dislodge it and just uh, go backwards in the design. Instead of advancing, go to the beginning of the design or advance to where the skip stitches occurred and stitch right on top. That's what I do. And remember, edge to edge quilting, right, Margaret? You're probably talking 50 hoopings, 50 repeats of the same design. Believe me, nobody's gonna see if you have stitched over about eight or 10, you know, lengths of an embroidery design in inches. So, wouldn't you agree? I agree completely. And we are our worst critics. We look at it every stitch. Nobody's gonna look at every stitch of the quilt. They're gonna look at the beauty of the yeah. entire quilt. 
I so know. yeah, I agree. You know, it, I had I learned that when uh, when we produced the magazine for twenty some years, right? So every two week, two months, uh, we would go to a professional photography studio and lay out all of the projects and come up with a photography plan. And the team at the studio who we worked with was a great, great group of very talented people. And they would look at these projects and I'd be, mm, you know, like, oh, my gosh, are they going to see how it's one eighth of an inch off from here or there? You know, they never noticed anything like that. They were wowed right. by the color, the creativity, just the overall feeling that that project portrayed, not our little tiny mistakes that we sweat about. So. All Absolutely. Right. Okay, let's see. Next question uh, is, I have to pay attention here. I'm not doing my job. Why does in the out, outline align with the design? <laughs> and you know what? That is so frustrating. You get this beautiful design done, and then your outline is an eighth of an inch off. So, yeah. so frustrating. So it goes back to what we talked about earlier. You need to make sure you're stabilized right. You need to make sure you've got your fabric prepped or in Eileen's term, your fabric stabilized, and then you need to stabilize the embroidery design. And I noticed that a lot of times I love the feature of color sort. So some of you may know that from working in software, it's on some sewing machines now also. So if you have a design that um, let's just talk easy. It goes red, white, blue, red, white, blue. You have the option to tell your machine to stitch all the red and then change and stitch or stitch a row of red, then a row of white, then a row of blue, then red, then white, then blue. So that requires six color changes. You also have the option to tell it to stitch all the red. So it would go this row of red and then it would jump over here and do this row of red. Then it would do this row of blue and then this row of blue or white, whatever order I had it in. But you get the idea here. Mm -hmm. So what happens is sometimes when it stitches this red and jumps over here and does this red, there's no stabilizing between those two reds. So what do they want to do? They want to come together and that can cause your outline to be off. So my suggestion is if you're doing a design that has an outline on it, I do not use my color sort and I am sure to stabilize well. And in some cases, I might even hoop. Um, so prepare my fabric, hoop my stabilizer and my fabric that's been prepared. And then I might even float a piece of stabilizer underneath. So I don't want to hoop two layers of, fab, of stabilizer, but I can float an extra one underneath. And that's what works well for me. Excellent. You know, and a good example of uh, the proper digitizing, right, is on cap embroidery. So on a, on a hat, you know, uh, professional digitizers digitize so that it starts stitching in the center and goes out to one side, comes back to the center and goes back to the outer edge. And, you know, that's because of push pull, right? So, you, you know, the fabric is always going to push out towards the edge of the embroidery design or push on all four sides, right? Push and pull, that, it's just a fact. So um, the color sorting, you really have to proceed with caution. We get a little lazy. We don't want to change colors that often. And so we often think, well, we'll outsmart the design and color sort, not always the best choice. Yeah. Okay, so Mary Hag wants to know what size needle for edge to edge quilting. So. Um, you know, Mary, it's really not about what you're doing there, like edge to edge quilting. It's the fabric that you're stitching on. So you're going to want to use a sharp fabric because I'm assuming that on edge to edge quilting, you're going to have a cotton top, a batting and a cotton quilting fabric on the back. So woven fabrics, and that would require a sharp needle. So let's see. Um, so let's share, Sherry Malay says, why don't you want to hoop two stabilizers? Well, shifting well, layers, right? Just more shifting layers. <laughs> Right. And your hoops are usually rounded at the corners. And when you try to put too much stuff in there, it mm -hmm. takes up the, the placing of hoops and it, it just doesn't work. It's it it just is not a good idea. Um, it's just like trying to embroider on the back pocket of blue jeans. Right. So you have on the back pocket, it is stitched to the jeans on the outside. Right. But if you're going to monogram that you're going to have shifting layers in the center. 
So it, you have to fuse it shut. That's what I do. I fuse that pocket shut. So now it's one layer, even though, you know, of course, you're not going to use the pocket anymore. But well, if you're a woman, you probably right. don't anyway. So. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. OK, so let's see. And um, the next question is, what are some tips for choosing thread colors? <laughs> I have to tell you, I was not very good at choosing thread colors. So I worked really hard at this. And the method that I found that worked best for me was to take a piece. So let's say I want to do an embroidery design on a plain black piece of fabric. And I want it to be in bright colors, but I don't have a clue what colors go together. Well, what you can do is you can get a piece of fabric. I don't have to love this design, but if I love the colors, then I know I like that combination of colors. And if I like it, then that's the right answer because it's my project. So then I would take this piece of fabric, I would go to my um, drawer that has all my thread in it, and I'd pull out my pinks, and I'd, I'd pull out a pink and a blue and a green, and I'd lay them all down there. And I'd match them exactly as I could to that. Then the next step that I like to do is I set the piece of fabric on my dining room table because it has good lighting with the thread next to it. And I walk by it a couple of times. And if you walk by and you keep saying, boy, I notice that yellow. I notice that yellow. Pull it out. It, it's not right. If you notice one color, it's probably not right for that color group. So if you wanted to do... Um, if you had an ivory piece of fabric and you loved these colors, it's really easy. Just match this pink to a thread, match this um, burgundy to one of your threads, match this green to one of your threads, match this kind of like khaki color to one of your threads. So you don't have to start from scratch and you don't have to guess. Now, if you don't have a piece of fabric, the other thing you can do if you're doing it on a solid is just take your fabric and do the same trick I do on my dining room table set them out there, walk by them a couple days. A lot of people move them to a different room because they're going to look different in different lighting. But you know what? If you're wearing a shirt, you're going to be in different lighting all day long. So, um, you know, just take some time to make those decisions. But matching them to fabric that you like, I think is a really good idea because you, you've got a really good head start on making good choices. That's great advice. Um, and I would add to that, as you analyze that fabric, like that beautiful paisley that you, you know, showed us, it has a black background, I'm assuming it's dark black. There's a lot of soft aqua and so forth. So pay attention to the amount of color in that pattern. Why, why are you so attracted to it? Do you really like to wear blacks or is it that light aqua? And how much of that light aqua are you going to incorporate into the design? Because if you just, you know, let's say there's five colors in a, the fabric that you love and you're going to select those five thread colors, you know, pay attention to how much is of each color in the finished design and that will give you really clear results. Another great tip is if you are a software user like myself, or many of you have machines that allow you to change the background of the screen of which you're viewing your designs on. So in software, uh, well, in software, I can actually take a photograph of the finished of the garment that I'm going to stitch on or a piece of fabric um, that I'm going to stitch on and load that as a backdrop into the embroidery design so I can really see what it's going to look like. Or I can just change the color of the screen. Like a, let's say I'm going, going to be make, working on a Christmas project and I'm definitely stitching on Christmas uh, green fabric. So I can change the color of my background screen to green and then whatever colors I put on top of that, thread colors, I'll know, are they gonna pop, contrast, blend, fade away? Yes. What's my goal? Yeah. Okay, so let's see. Oh, and Barbara Jane's, Jones says, and those little dots in the selvage work well too. They sure did. Yeah, I wrote an article about that. It was really great. Now, Marion Malone says, well, how do you float stabilizer? Do you tape it down? Well, Margaret, I don't. I literally just slide it under and, you know, before stitching the first color of the design and let the design capture it and hold it to uh, the hooped item. How about you? 
That's what I do. So once I have my hoop on the machine, you can usually, my hoop attaches on the left. So I just kind of lift up the right hand side and I slide that stabilizer under there and it just stays because you're going, it's got the feed dogs that are kind of grabbing it at the bottom. And I usually, I usually baste most of my designs anyway, and it just gets hooked in with the basting. So yeah, you no need to tape it or anything. And the scariest thing is trying it the first time. Once you do it the first time, it, it's easy. Now, if you are doing an applique and your floating stabilizer, pay attention when you, you know, take that hoop off and you put it back on, make sure that that stabilizer mm -hmm. underneath isn't folded on itself because now you'll have a double layer. You know, it'll still <laughs> stick. I've done it a gazillion times, but keep an eye on that. Okay, hey, right. so our friend Esther Hoplin, who does beautiful work, I'm familiar with her work, she has started to use a color wheel and she says that her uh, selecting colors is going so much better. I, and I use a color wheel all the time because, you know, we get really confused about color, right? And there's so many colors, but really there's primary colors and everything else is in between. So if you kind of curate down your thread choices to the primary colors and then work away from them because we don't want to wear all blue, red, and, and green all the time. Right. So, uh, but use a color wheel. It's very helpful. Absolutely. Okay. So let's see. So what's next? So next, what's next is, um, will my magnetic hoop dam will a magnetic hoop damage a machine? So, when uh, the inversion machines were first available for home so use back in, you know, when you started, Margaret, and when I started, we were advised not to put a magnetic pin cushion on the bed of the machine. And at that time, that was good advice. But today, our embroidery machines are highly insulated. The brain of your embroidery machine is encaptured on the, you know, the head of the machine, right? The right side where we sit and see that beautiful screen. And it's about the size of your thumbnail. And, you know, here's my cell phone, which is as powerful as my laptop and desktop computer. So, you know, things have really changed. You don't have to worry about a magnetic hoop damaging your machine. And believe me, we test all of our hoops before they are released to the public. So when a new machine comes out or a new hoop size, we test it in our uh, lab at the office and make sure that no harm is uh, done to any machine. And, you know, logistically, we have hundreds of hoops, magnetic hoops in our warehouse that are really just on the other side of the wall from all of our sewing machines, all of our embroidery machines. And in my actual sewing studio in the office, there are probably 25 different hoops on the wall and machines in there and no harm, no harm at all. So just don't worry about it. It's gonna be fine. Okay, let's see, what's our next color? I mean, our next question is, um, what stabilizer should I use on a t-shirt? Well, you know, there's a really great way to find that answer, and that is by your embroiderer's compass. So let's go ahead and take a look at the embroiderer's compass so that you can get a good idea of what it looks like. So as you can see, on the outer edge of the wheel, it has um, an arrow pointing towards different fabric types. And underneath that, arrow that says fabric, there's an opening and it's telling you what stabilizer to choose. And as you go down under the center of the compass, you'll notice that it says needle. And here it's telling you what size needle to use. And of course, this is all written by Deborah Jones, right? And so she has even provided her um, recommendations uh, for different hooping techniques and so forth. So you're going to find all of the um, all the details that you need to embroider anything. So on a t-shirt, she's going to tell you to use no-show mesh or a very light cutaway for larger designs. So, and the needle that she recommends is a light ball point. 
in and a extra slim ballpoint in sizes 7010 to 7511. Um, so, you know, and then she tells you hoop the stabilizer to reduce shifting apply embroidery spray. So if, you, if you're not using a fusible stabilizer, you can always use a temporary spray adhesive to turn any stabilizer into a temporary fusible stabilizer. So awesome. Wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. And it goes back to having the right tools, Eileen. I mean, if you have that tool, you you take all the guesswork out of it. You might get to the point where you don't refer to it because you do the same type of embroidery. But as soon as you switch to something else, it's mm -hmm. so comforting to know what the expert has to say about right. it. Right. So, and, and sometimes we forget. I mean, you know, we switch projects a lot and, you know, we hold up a roll of the white stuff. <laughs> is this the one that I use for that light t-shirt or is this what I use for sweatshirts? So yeah, it's awesome. It's just awesome. Okay. Uh, and she spent a tremendous amount of time um, creating the embroiderer's compass and she, we updated, you know, dime updates it annually. Uh, if product changes and so forth and she always stays yeah. on top of it. It's just great. So let's see. Um, and when, you, well, Julianne is asking, when you do uh, t-shirts, do you prep the, the stabilizer for embroidery? Well, I'll answer what I do. I don't on t-shirts because what I love about a t-shirt is it's stretchy and fluid and I like to keep that. But how about you, Margaret? You might have a different um, answer. I just did about 60 um, shirts for um, a company that uh, Boeing actually, and wow. I did not prep a single one of those because the tearaway stabilizer, I'm sorry, the cutaway stabilizer is is what, what you need. So the stabilizer, which is a cutaway, it's not stretchy, it stays in forever, is going to stabilize it just fine. So no, I personally don't stabilize it um, when I do mine. Okay. And would you use a topping when you're embroidering a t-shirt? I don't personally. Um, when I'm doing a sweatshirt, I don't either, but I know people who do, but I find that I get excellent results without it. So if I don't need it, I don't do it. Right. And the only time I would use a topper is if it's a, like a cotton bouquet that has, you know, hills and valleys, it's like a textured mm -hmm. top, then I would probably use it. But, you know, they're not as popular as they used to be. So you don't always find them anymore. Um, okay, so let's see what our next slide is. Uh, next question, how do I land a design where I want it? Million dollar question there, right, Margaret? Yes, absolutely. So how I like to do it is, um, let's say it's uh, a garment embellishment that I'm doing, not left chest, not just center chest. Maybe I'm going to do something down the shoulder. So, you know, no traditional placement guide. So I print templates of the embroidery design or designs. And I do that right in our free software, Embroidery Toolshed, which is free to anyone. You can go to our website and download it and open your design in Embroidery Toolshed. Go to File, Print, and it will print a template with a crosshair designating the center of the design so that you know, you know where it's going to stitch. And when I print my templates, I print it on a product called Print and Stitch, print and stitch <laughs> Target Template Paper because it's translucent and sticky. It's adhesive. It's a temporary. Um, and I'm just going to use it on top. I'm not stitching through this. But I can place that template on my garment and stand in front of the mirror and decide if that placement is correct. Is it flattering? Is it, will it fit in that space? And once I'm happy with where that placement is and then take the garment off and that template will stay in place because it's tacky. And I hoop centering that template in the hoop. Now, many of you have machines with all kinds of bells and whistles, like projectors and scanners and so forth. But unless you know where you want it to land on the, on the fabric, on the garment, those features really can't help you, right, Margaret? Oh, I agree. And I do it the exact same way you do. I love the sticky templates because you can put it on and make sure it's working on your body, on the garment you're doing it on, and it looks good. And then it just stays exactly where it is. I leave it on. I get everything hooped up. I make sure my needle is going to go exactly in that crosshair. 
and your placement is going to be perfect every time. But you do re need to remember, like Eileen said, you do need to remember to take that off before you um, before you go ahead and start embroidering. And that is exactly how I did those shirts um, for Boeing. I put them on, I stuck them on, and you can use the template. In my case, I was doing lots of designs over and over. I didn't have to print out 60 of those designs. I used it several times on several different t-shirts and then got a new one when oh, the sticky was right. Gone. Yeah, there, you can use them over and over. And of course for quilting, I mean, I, it's the same thing for quilting, right? So your edge to edge quilting, that's what I'm using. I'm using that template and I connect that uh, stitch line to the previously stitched embroidery design. And then when I advance my fabric, centering the template for the new design in the sewing field, I'm good to go. And I can use that template over and over. In fact, like a one queen size quilt, you can, you know, one template will last through. It's awesome. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like here's Patricia Roberts. She says she uses print and stick for her edge to edge quilting designs and alignment is perfect. It is, you know, because if you're taping down a template or if you're pinning a template, you know, they move, right? They're not always staying exactly where you want it to. So anyway, okay. So yeah. let's see, Marion, she does have all the bells and whistles, a camera and scanner, but she always prints it out first. Then she places where she wants it and scans it with the camera on top to line it up. It's great advice, great advice. Yeah. And also it makes it many times it's easier to see when you um, are using a template and the scanner. Cause if you have a busy fabric and you're trying to, you know, identify the embroidery design and the scan on that busy fabric, that can be difficult. But if you are just matching the design to the template, easier to do. So for those so of you who don't know, I probably just lost you. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I like the template because let's say I put it on my shirt this way. So it's up and down here. And then I go to my machine and I get it all hooped. And I always look to make sure that my template that's on my shirt in the hoop on the machine exactly matches what I see on the screen. Because maybe I've forgotten that I had to rotate that design in on the screen, which means it's going to stitch sideways in the hoop. So I can look at my template and I can see, oh, this doesn't match. I need to rehoop or rotate or whatever. So it's a double check to make sure it's facing the right way and not upside down or whatever on the hoop. On Absolutely. The or, you know, orientation is the last thing, right? You have to make sure it's, you know, M is going to be Mary's monogram and not Wilma's. And boy, what a nightmare. <laughs> That's that last thing if you don't catch it. Oh boy. Let's see. Okay. So our next question is, how can I learn to do more with my embroidery machine? Margaret, I'm going to throw that to you because I know the number one, you know, one way to do it is use your machine, but there are other ways too. So go ahead, Margaret. There is. So everybody who's watching this today is doing one of the most important things. They're going to good sources for education. And I'd like to plug the Virtual Sewing Guild at this point because that is my love, is sharing with you how to get great results. So you see behind me, this is a quilt. I did not make this. Some of you may know Simon and Jenny Haskins. Simon stitched this out. And since I've taken over the Jenny Haskins line of designs, I, Jenny was gracious enough to give me the samples. So this year in our premium membership, we're creating this quilt. And back to the whole color thing, you may look at this quilt and say, oh my gosh, I love it. I can't wait to do it. And some of you may look at this and say, oh my gosh, I hate it. Well, let me ask you a question about loving it or hating it. Do you love it because it's greens and blues? Or do you hate it because it's greens and blues? So this time when I make mine, I'm doing it. I love purples and pinks. So I, green and blue, it's a beautiful quilt, but it is not colors that I would choose for myself. They're just not my colors. I still love the quilt, but I think I'm going to love it even more when I do it in my colors. So be sure when you look at things, do I like it because of color or do I hate it because of color? So we're doing that quilt. And then we're doing six projects and the one project, oh, it's mirrored image that you see behind me, this little Easter egg, that's a mini wall hanging. So that's another project we're doing. And we do some sit and sew classes where you actually join me live and I sit and make the project with you and you make your project and we get to show them all at the end. And they're, the projects are exclusive for one year. So if you're in the membership, like the Easter egg, 
no, over there, still over there. Um, the Easter egg, you won't find that on my website until this membership year is over. So it's exclusive. And these, um, the placemat over on that side was exclusive last year. So it's not on the site yet. But again, think about color. Here it is in pink. Beautiful. Okay, here it is in pink. And here it is in purple. So the same basic placemat, but think about your colors. And we talk about all those kinds of things. We talk about how to hoop, how to stabilize, how to get the best results. We have show and tell. Um, we're doing the quilt. We've got six other projects. We've got four hands-on classes. And you have access to um, talk to me with any of your questions. And that's part of the premium membership. But one size doesn't fit all. So we have a monthly membership. It's only $4.97 a month. And I put lots of great information in that membership for you. And then for those of you who just want to stick your big toe in and find out a little bit, we have a free membership. So you can find that all at virtualsewingguild.net. Thank you, Eileen, for letting me talk about Virtual Sewing Guild. I'm so happy that I'm able to do this. Oh, you're so welcome, Margaret. You know, it's a great service you provide. And it seems like you have something for everyone, all different levels of commitment, experience, skill, you name it. That's awesome. You know, I just want to give a shout out to Judy Warren. She says, you know, um, that I give such great advice and we're all blessed to have her and all the others. Well, really, I'm blessed to have people like Margaret who can come on and share their knowledge because, you know, it's hard to carry all this by <clears throat> with just one person. And, you know, in the whole community of the embroidery community, they're so sharing and giving and um, we love what we do and it shows, right? It's awesome. Yeah, so let's see, they want to put the, the link for the Virtual Sewing Guild, so we'll get that up in a minute, and there it is right there, so uh, isn't that awesome? So let's see, you know, I hope people are participating in the On the House, so this is a free program that we have going on all year, Margaret, so why don't we go ahead and take a look at that, and um, uh, let's see, oh, where am I at now? Now I'm back on the babies. Okay, so here we go, uh, the, the mega giveaway, so... I've got a, sorry, Sam. <laughs> Here we go. I hope I'm on the right one. Yeah, let's see. We're going to add this one to stream. Okay, so our mega giveaway, if you remember, I announced it last week, and you can enter often. You can enter now. You can enter once a day. So what's in it? It's $3,200 worth of dime product. Software is included. Word Art and Stitches, Patch and Applique Maker, and My Block Piecer. And... Next up is some embroidery collections. You're going to get Joanne Banco's Just Jackets, the Vintage Clutch Collection, and my latest embroidery collection, which is Just Earrings. In addition to that, you will also receive software lessons for those software programs that you won. The Sally Tomato Pressing Station with those curved edges, which is just great for making handbags with, you know, curved edges, right? We don't want any sharp points or corners on those types of designs. The Stitch Ripper is included. So remember, this is $3,200 worth of product. The Jumbo Hoop Guard, um, my favorite tool. I never do a quilt without the Jumbo Hoop Guard. The Spray Tent. Oh, we may laugh at the Spray Tent, but boy, is it handy to have that in your sewing studio. You know, it just takes up a small footprint, about 13 inches square. You set it in a corner, and when you have to use temporary spray adhesive, you can uh, place the fabric in that small tent and spray away, and you don't get any overspray anywhere else. You're going to get a tube of Class A bobbins, which is just remember we were talking about bobbins, right? Well, pre-wounds are the way to go. You don't have to waste any time on uh, winding them yourself. You'll like them. And you're going to get the entire combination of our poly patch twill fabrics, the three colorways, athletic, uniform, and bright, and their companion thread. So it's 24 spools of thread and 24 different sheets of uh, the poly twill. You're also going to get quartet of our fine line thread. That's the 60 weight that we use for micro lettering and uh, two spools of our 5,000 meters. So for those of you who would like to do edge to edge quilting, or maybe you have a multi-needle machine, you're going to find that these 5,000 meters, they're big cones, uh, get the job done and they last a long time. So you won't have to, you know, always place on a new spool. 
Our most popular uh, new colors are the purple and orange of the King Star Metallic, which is the industry's leading metallic thread. Doesn't kink, doesn't break. You're going to love that. And lastly, all of our color plays. Now, these are those uh, thread kits of five threads. So you get one variegated thread and the four 40 weight exquisite components that make up that variegated. Talk about playing with your in your embroidery studio. That's super fun. And you're going to get our step specialty stabilizers. You know, there's the type of stabilizers that you don't use all that often, but you really wish you had for special occasions. And, you know, like we have the sew in heat and, um, oh, I can't see all those sides, but the water soluble topping, our patch attach fusible and the stud and such, fuse and stick, fuse so soft, all of those, a lot of those that we were talking about in today's question session, it is really um, quite a bonus. So remember, enter every day. And on May 5th, we're going to pick the winner, which is going to be so much fun. Well, in addition to that, we also do every week, we do a free design that we give away and we call that our on the house program. So um, before we look at this week's free design, let's take a look at some of the projects that you have been creating with the on the house designs. So over here in, um, in this example, here we have our friend, uh, Renaud Paulson. She did that beautiful Easter egg and she kind of made like a small table mat out of it. I love her colors. We've seen a lot of work from uh, Ms. Paulson over the years as she has participated in our small town charms and our doors from 2020. So I'm familiar with her work. It's always flawless. And here's Reen Wilcoxon. She did the shy unicorn. You know, Reen impresses me and she's in today's watch. She's watching today. It's always great to have her here. But, you know, she doesn't hesitate to jump on a project. Margaret, do you know Reen, right, from Embroidery Garden? I don't think I do, but I want to. Okay. Well, <laughs> I'm telling you, no moss grows under her feet. You know, you put up a design and she is coming up with a project almost immediately. This is adorable. So she stitched it on a Mickey fabric and then um, made a border with another beautiful textured fabric from Shannon Fabrics. Oh, love it. It's a really great job. And the horn is she added mylar in the horn of the shy unicorn. Here's Candy Bray. Now, Candy Bray has been really keeping up with the On the House projects every month. I'm always impressed when I see. Now, she added Mylar and some metallic King Star touches to her bunnies. Now, if you remember, the bunnies were uh, a download and they were two designs, one for the bunny front and one for the bunny back. So she said in her notes that she was able to add four of the bunnies in a four by four hoop. She really had a blast doing that. Well done. Really well done. Candy also did the Shy Unicorn and she used our fabric markers to color in like, like the face of the unicorn, the ears. And I think maybe she did Mylar in the horn. Isn't that nice? Yeah. I know. And here is a, uh, a, a one of our friends from Europe. I don't know how to pronounce her name, but she did it and then put it in a wooden hoop. Love that. Great wall decor. Great wall decor. This week we have a, uh, a beautiful butterfly run stitches that are done in our King Star Metallic. It's a beautiful combination of three beautiful metallic threads. We have the aqua, that kind of rose gold, and a, and a pink, and they blend beautifully. When stitched on a dark color, it is just going to pop. It's going to be super, e super easy to do. So I hope that you will uh, take advantage of this week's On the House Design. Remember, it's a free download. You just go on over to dzgns.com and download the design. And all of the designs from the year are still there. But, you know, keep up with it. Go every week and download it. Because at the end of the year, 52 downloads is going to be a lot to, keep, to do at one sitting. Right, Margaret? Absolutely. That's so cool. Those projects are so nice. You get they Love it. and you know, everybody just jumps into it. They you know do they just they bring their creativity to it. It's awesome. So Margaret, that was a fun class with you today, wasn't it? Oh my gosh, I just loved it. And like I said, I love seeing those designs. We all learn from each other. I always learn 
probably more. I mean, I'm so much more educated now because of all your tips, all those great projects. I love being around other people who sew. It just, it's fun and we're always learning and that's, that's Absolutely. what's important. Yeah. And if you want to take advantage of more sessions like this, I encourage you to visit the Virtual Sewing Guild. Margaret has several options for you to participate, to gain more knowledge, and to share your own knowledge. So it's super fun. Thanks for joining me today, Margaret. And we'll see you here next week at 1 o'clock Central Time for our next issue of Between Friends. And you're going to be led. Uh, that class will be held by Ashley Jones. So we'll look forward to that. That'll be a great class. Thank you, Eileen. Oh, Thank you, Margaret. Bye, everyone.